Open your Bibles, if you would please, this morning to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis and chapter number 16. I guess I do uh, have to confess that uh, after my trip, over to Israel, uh, it, it sort of uh, sort of flavored some of the different things that I uh, I've been impressed uh, to share with y'all. And uh, uh, now we're going to be talking about a location in the Scripture this morning that we really don't know exactly where it is. Uh, this is one of those uh, more unusual, obscure things, and yet the truth here is, is so important. And I want to tie in a little bit later on in the message to uh, to to another great truth that should really give us a lot of comfort. But I, I've got a sort of strange title on this particular message. I call it Our Own Personal Beer Laharoi. Okay? Now, uh, don't, don't just drop the Laharoi and say, okay, he's finally come around. No, we ain't going to go there. All right? Uh, this is one preacher that hates alcohol as much today as I ever did. In fact, I probably hate it more today than I ever have. I've just seen it do too much destruction in people's hearts and lives. But uh, there's a place in the Bible that is referred to as Beer Laharoi. And uh, and it's a very important location, even though you may not find it mentioned often. It was uh, it was a, it was a place of, of really personal comfort uh, for someone uh, that is mentioned here in Scripture. So uh, Genesis 16. Uh, let's begin with verse number five. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God, and uh, then we'll go to the Lord in prayer after we finish up through verse number 14. The Bible says this. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand, do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Let me just stop just a moment. Sarai later on would become known as Sarah. And, and Abram would later on become known as Abraham. God had not changed their names yet when this had happened. All right? And the Bible says, she fled from her face, in verse 7, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Beer Laharoi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. That means, Thou God seest me. That's what Beer Laharoi means. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Thank you so much, Lord, for this day. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, I pray for a special moving of the Spirit of God this morning in our service. I pray, Lord, that you would begin in my heart and life. And dear God, I pray that you would just speak to every one of us today and may our hearts and lives be drawn closer to you. And if there's anyone here today that needs to know you as Savior, Lord, may you just uh, move in their heart and may they be willing to say yes to Jesus. So guide us and direct us and we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you very much. You may be seated. You know, uh, whenever I read the Bible... I like to, to take Scripture and rather than just reading it as a novel or reading it as literature or reading it and say, well, that's a good storyline for somebody else, I always feel like I get the most out of Scripture whenever I read it. And then I begin to stop and think about it. How can I apply this to me? How can I make this personal? 
By the way, you will get a whole lot more out of the Word of God if you learn to make it personal. Of course, you also need the leadership of the Spirit of God as you read the Word of God. Otherwise, you're not going to understand it anyhow because the Bible says that the Bible is spiritually discerned. In other words, God helps our understanding of Scripture. Okay, but but we can need to make it personal. I believe there's all kind of accounts in the Bible that that we can look and apply it to ourselves and say, you know what? There have been times in my life that that fit perfectly for what I was going through. You know, Hagar is one of those characters in the Bible that we really don't know much about. Uh, right away when I mention Hagar, some of y'all right away start thinking about Hagar the Horrible, the, uh, the comic strip. Okay, maybe you don't think about that at all, but I guess maybe my mind does. And uh, But the reality is, uh, Hagar here is a, is a woman. She was a maid to uh, Sarah, as she would be known later. And of course, without going into a lot of detail, uh, uh, they all got into a mess. By the way, any time we try to step in and help God out, we many times can make a mess of things. Okay? God had made a promise to Abram and, and Sarah that they were going to have a child. Well, time went along and there was no child. And, and they began to realize, hey, we're getting to the point, we're at the age where it's just not going to happen anymore. So they decided we're going to help God out. And it was customary. It, it was not contrary to their culture. By the way, that, that makes a good point. Let me remind you of something. Just because something is culturally acceptable does not mean that it is biblically correct. Amen? We are rapidly getting into a society today that there's a whole lot of things that are just fine and dandy according to the culture that still goes contrary to the Word of God. In fact, the Word of God refers to it as an abomination. And we got to make up our mind. Are we going to stand with God or are we going to go with culture? Okay? They decided... They were going to go ahead and do that which was culturally acceptable. So Sarah gave her maid to Abraham and said, Abraham, have a child by her. So Abram went with the program. Okay? Hagar is expecting a child. Sarah begins to get jealous because she was able to have a child and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, Sarah had not been able to and so things got very testy and so Hagar took off running, going into the wilderness, trying to get away from the situation and while she was out there, she ended up at a well and, and she met God there. By the way, we can meet the same God whenever we're feeling uh, overwhelmed and in despair. And th this place was called the well, the well Beer Laharoi. And, and because she was lost and overwhelmed and came face to face with Almighty God. That, that is a wonderful, wonderful story. Now, now let me just go back up here and, and give you some things. And, and let's just wrap our brains around this because we need to understand this. Listen. Uh, maybe you're one of these people that you say, you know what, for the last six months, my life has been absolutely peaches and cream, and I have not had the first frustration or irritation about anything. I got more money than I can spend. My health is wonderful. Everybody loves me. Uh, if, if you uh, are in that sh uh, case, would you see me after church? I want to try to see if some of it will rub off on me. Amen. Amen. I have learned life has challenges. We're all going to face difficulties of varying kinds from time to time. I mean, yesterday uh, afternoon, I ended up making two hospital calls and realized, man, people, people go through difficulties. People go through struggles. We're all going to face those times of great difficulty. Now, let me tell you some things about difficulty. Okay? Some difficulty is manufactured by our own unwise or sinful choices. A lot of times we bring our trouble on ourselves. Let's be honest. It does happen. 
What does the Bible say in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7? It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know, listen, the truth of the matter is you make bad choices. You follow the devil. You, you follow the desires of your flesh. Why in the world should we be surprised when we end up getting a less than holy and righteous a harvest on our choices. Listen. Best way to avoid those kind of problems is make wise choices. You know, I, I've, I've, I've used this comment many, many times over the years. But you know what? I have learned the best way for me to avoid getting drunk is I never take the first drink. You know what? That, 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 just, that just ends up solving the problem. I don't have to worry about it. If I don't take the first one, I'll never end up in that kind of situation. The best way for me to never, ever, ever become a drug addict is I'm not going to abuse drugs in any way. That's the wise thing. Hey, you're worried about AIDS? Then don't get into a situation where you might catch them. Amen? Or get infected. You might say, well, yeah, but some things happen other than that. I'll get to that in just a moment. But what I'm trying to say is a lot of times our problems are caused by our own choices. Now, you say, but that didn't apply to Hagar. Well, some difficulty is caused by the unwise or sinful choices of others. You know, I frankly, even though Abraham did not have a Bible that he could hold in his hand, I got a feeling if Abram would have gone to God and said, God, our culture says it's okay for me to have my wife's handmaid, to have a child that you promised to me. Is that okay with you? What do you think God would have said? You think God would have said, sounds hunky-dory to me, go for it, buddy. Or do you think God would have said, uh-uh. Because by the way, later on, God did show up on the scene and said, no, that's not the son of promise. You're still going to have the son of promise. That's not the one. Had he gone to God, God would have given him direction. I believe Abram and, 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 and Sarai blew it. Now, they had good intentions, but they still blew it. They were trying to help God out, but they still blew it. I mean, that this was the problem. Sometimes it's the choices of others. How about this? How about all those people? I still remember the day vividly on 9-11, 2001. I still remember I was, I was in the, uh, in the, uh, walking back and forth between the bedroom and the living room and the kitchen. I think I was probably going back and forth getting coffee. I know you find that hard to imagine. And, uh, all of a sudden, you know, the, the news went to the, uh, you know, went to, uh, there to New York City and there was smoke coming coming out of one of the Twin Towers, and they were saying, well, yeah, well, we don't know what happened, but it seems like maybe an airplane uh, accidentally flew into uh, one of the towers. And, and then I was there saying, man, that is crazy, and I'm watching it. And then all of a sudden, I remember vividly when the other plane came crashing into the other tower. I saw it happen on TV. And right away, I said, no, that's not an accident. America was under attack. Let me ask you, those 3,000 plus people that died on 9-11, was that their choice to die on that day? No, it was the sinful actions of other people. How about Fort Hood? When that crazy guy that was actually in the army goes there and starts shooting a lot of people. And of course our politicians say, well that was workplace violence. And they're ignoramuses. That was terrorism. Orlando, terrorism. I mean, uh, San Bernardino, terrorism. I mean, listen, sometimes uh, difficulties come because of the sinful actions of others. And by the way, let me just go ahead and say this. Sometimes difficulty is going to come and we may not be able to put our finger on it and say, well, I've committed a sin or somebody else committed a sin. It's just trouble. And by the way, we're part of a fallen race that is prone to that. Job 14 verse number 1 says it well. Job said, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> Listen, until we get redeemed, until we get our glorified body, 
we're sometimes going to uh, just have to face the fact that things are sometimes difficult. Hagar was facing time of great difficulty. And then as a result, she ran off and, and, and fled into the wilderness. And sometimes we may literally feel like we're lost in the wilderness. You know, here's the problem that I see with her. She takes off running and, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, she gets out there and, and you know, whenever, whenever you just start fleeing with no destination in mind, you're going to end up in trouble. I remember a long time ago hearing Jerry Clower. And uh, many of you don't remember who Jerry Clower was, but he was an interesting character. And, and Jerry Clower said that he had an old man that lived in his community. And the first time an airplane ever flew overhead that was doing uh, skywriting, you know, where they'd use their, their smoke, uh, the, the old boy couldn't read. And he didn't know what was going on. He just looked up and saw some words appearing in the sky. And he took off running down the road. Running as hard as he could. Somebody stopped him and says, Where are you going? He says, Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. So well, how do you know his judgment is coming? He says, I don't know. But when words show up in the sky, I figure God's getting ready to judge. He said, well, do you think it's going to do any good to, for you to run from it? He says, I don't know. I was just going to run till it overtook me. <laughs> and that's the way a lot of us do sometimes. We, we, we're, we're running without destination when we run without destination we end up in the wilderness here's Hagar in the wilderness by a well in difficulty I mean discouraged I mean uh, I mean listen and, and anytime we get into that situation there's that that's a problem listen we need in our lives the constant guidance of the Lord to keep us from being lost in the wilderness Psalm 139 I love this passage verse 23 it says search me O God and know my heart yea try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting listen that should be a constant constant prayer on our lips. Search me, O oh God. Look what's in me. See if there's anything that's lead me in the wrong direction and then lead me in the way everlasting. Listen, I got news for you. Uh, you and I, you may not like this, but let me say it anyhow. We don't have enough sense to be our own spiritual GPS. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. Lead me in the way everlasting. Listen, and, and the reality is no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, God has promises for us to rest upon. I was thinking about this just the other day as I was studying. When Sandy and I were in college, I remember in, in homiletics class, one particular guy, his favorite passage of Scripture I'm getting ready to share with you. And this was the passage of Scripture that he used to preach his, his sermon for homiletics class. And uh, here's the passage. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and, and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now here's, here's the key. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are given exceeding great and precious promise. You know, it had been good enough if the, if the Bible would have just been, said, hey, we've been given great promises. That would have been enough. Amen? But the Bible doesn't say that. It's not just great promises, but it is exceeding great and precious promises. And these are the things that help us to become partakers of the divine nature. And help us to be delivered from the corruption that is all around us in the world. God has promises for us to rest upon. Listen, I've learned this. Sometimes all we've got to rest upon is the promise of God. That's it. I think I shared this some weeks, months back. 
a guy in the Philippine Islands. They found him out there. I think it was like in the 1960s. They found him in the jungles of the Philippine Islands. He was a soldier in World War II. He got separated from his company. They said, we'll be back. And he never knew that the war was over. And he had been out in the jungles for 20 years doing his duty because they made the promise they were coming back. Now, by the way, I'm glad they finally got him home. Amen? Amen. But I got news for you. We got somebody that is better than, uh, than, than the promise of a general. We've got somebody that's better than the promise of a politician. We've even got someone that's better than the promise of a family member. I have learned this. Sometimes people will let us down. But blessed be God, when God makes a promise, you can bank on it. Amen? They are exceeding great and precious promises. What a great truth that is. But here's the good thing. We're never out of God's vision and potential provision. You know, when Hagar went running out in the wilderness, she went out there, I, and I don't know what all was going on in her mind, but I can, I can just envision her. She's fleeing. She's got, you know, she's expecting a child. Ishmael has not been born yet, and she's just fleeing into the wilderness and has no idea where she's going. And she happens upon this well, and she just falls down there in despair. And I can see her weeping and, and calling out and not knowing what to do, figuring that she's probably going to die there in the wilderness. And all of a sudden, God begins to speak to her. And she says, wow, I'm just a handmaiden. And yet God is looking over my life. She says, she says in, in the passage, she says, thou, this is a quote, thou God seest me. And I like that. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, and verse 23. It says this, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Listen, God sees us no matter where we are. Even if we think we're close to Him or whether we think we're far away from Him, He still sees us. She said, Thou God seest me. And then she goes on and makes another statement. And this is a crucial statement. She says, I also here looked after him that seeth me. Now that's our responsibility. It's good for us to know that God sees us. But our responsibility is to look after the one that we know sees us. What's the Bible say in the book of Isaiah? It says, seek ye the Lord... While he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Now let me just go ahead and help you understand something. God never gets lost. Amen. But listen, it's our responsibility to draw near to God. And as we draw near to God, he draws near to us. We turn our back on God. The distance begins to magnify between us and God. She says, I have looked after him that seeth me. Here's the thing, I guess, that sort of prompted the whole message. When I was in Israel at the Sea of Galilee, now to be honest, my opinion, the Sea of Galilee area, much more beautiful than around Jerusalem. If I was going to pick a place to live in Israel, I'd live up around the Sea of Galilee. Beautiful, beautiful land. Everything's almost desert and stark down around Jerusalem. But you know, somebody, one of the preachers mentioned this, and it just grabbed my attention. He said, you know, when Jesus sent the disciples into the boat and told them to go to the other side. You see, I always had it in my mind that the Sea of Galilee, yeah, I've been down to Lake Okeechobee. Anybody ever been to Lake Okeechobee? All right. 
You get on one side of Lake Okeechobee and look across, you can't see the other side. That is a huge, huge lake. You know, the Sea of Galilee is not that big. You're standing on the mountains on one side, you can easily see the mountains on the other side. When Jesus told the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side, and he went up into the mountain to pray, did you know they were never out of his sight? That blessed me. Never out of his sight. You know, in Matthew chapter 14, let me, let me lay the foundation a little bit here with you. It says, And straightway Jesus constrained His disciples to get into a ship and to go before Him unto the other side while He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, He was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out, for fear. Now there's so much more there. Peter actually got out of the boat and walked toward Jesus and, and as soon as they got on the boat everything calmed down. But you know I got a whole new perspective of that thing. When Jesus sent them out there from where he was praying on the mountain at any moment he could look right out there on the Sea of Galilee and he knew exactly where they were and what they were doing. Wow. Wow. And by the way, I found out, I remember one day we were there, it was calm, hot, sort of like it's been here this week, and all of a sudden, the wind started whipping between those mountains, and there were literally white caps out there on the Sea of Galilee. There was no rain the whole time I was there, but there were white caps. That wind just blew and blew and blew, and then all of a sudden it would stop. And it, it all would be channeled through those mountains. And I said, you know, I, I believe I could see how that could happen. There's the disciples. The wind picks up. The storm begins. Jesus sees them. Knows they're in trouble. Jesus goes walking out onto the sea where they are. You know, sometimes our journey will start clear and become stormy. But in those times... He sees. Show me that picture there, guys. That's the actual Sea of Galilee. I took that from one side. Did you notice it doesn't look that far? You got the other side. Had there been a boat out there, you'd have been able to tell. Details about that boat. It sometimes everything looks clear ahead, and when you least expect it, a storm may come up. But here's the good news. When Jesus saw him caught in the storm, he walked out to him. He got on the boat with him. He never lost sight of him. He got out there, entered the boat, and the waves calmed. You know, let me just close with this thought. Jesus already knew that that stormy night would end. And you know what? No matter what difficulty or struggle sometimes we might go through, you know, our storm will end. But no matter what, Jesus will be present with us. As the sunrise over the same Sea of Galilee, it was early one morning, I got up, walked out there into a grassy area right outside my room, and clipped that, uh, made that picture with my iPad. And it reminded me of the old gospel song that I used to hear Howard Jewell sing many years ago. He was saying, And the sun's coming up in the morning. Every tear will be gone from our eyes. Why? Because the sun's coming up in the morning. And by the way, that doesn't mean just the S-U-N. That means the S. Oh, in. He's coming. Everything's going to be all right. If our faith and our trust is in Him. Oh, we might go, go through some trials. But no matter what, the sun is coming up in the morning. You know, one of the most precious promises in the Bible is the promise that Jesus said, I'll never forsake you. 
No matter where you are today in your life, God sees you. If Hagar could run into the wilderness and God would meet her there and she says, Thou God seest me. If Jesus could send his disciples out into the Sea of Galilee and yet from the other side he would see them caught in the midst of the sea in the storm and walked out to them, I want you to understand, he sees us. He is aware of our need. What we need to do is just react like Hagar and say, Okay, God, you see me. I seek after you. I believe he's waiting to give us comfort, direction, strength, and maybe for you, salvation. You know, our own personal beer, Laha Roy, is ours when we see the hand of God in our affairs and we're willing to put our faith and trust in him. God help us. Aren't you glad we serve a God that sees us? We never get lost in the shuffle. He sees us. That's a good promise. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Appreciate your good attention. Let the Lord speak to your heart. Do you feel like you're lost in the wilderness today? You say, well, not really, but I'm on the edge. (laughs) And let me remind you, there's a God who sees you. Feel like you're caught in the middle of a storm? Not sure if you're going to make it? Jesus is watching. And at the right time, He'll come. We just got to be willing to receive Him when He comes. Maybe you're here today and you're not 100% sure that you know Jesus as Savior. Today's a good day to get that settled. You come. We'll have somebody take their Bible and show you how to trust Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for loving us today. Do your perfect work in all of our hearts and lives. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. What if I could tell you that I could share with you the best news imaginable? I'm sure that'd be a refreshing thought when we consider that normally what we hear on television and the radio today is nothing but bad news. What if I could share with you the fact that we could spend eternity in a perfect place where everything is joyful and there's no more sin or death or suffering. Of course, the Bible tells us that place is called heaven. Now, there are many religions that all have different ways to tell you how they perceive that you could get to heaven. Most religions say, do this, do that, do the other. And if you do enough of the good stuff, then you just might make it. I'm glad that there's a better way than what religion says. The Bible tells us that God loves us. In fact, in John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the fact of the matter is we could never do enough on our own to be acceptable to God because we're sinners, we're fallen, and God knows that. And that's why Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood. But that's not the end of the story. When they put his body in the grave, three days and three nights later, the Bible says that he rose again. He conquered death. And today, he's seated at the right hand of the Father to be our Savior, to be our High Priest, to be the mediator between us and a holy and righteous God. Now, for us to have the right relationship with Him, it's not that we have to do things to earn His favor. He's already done all that is necessary. He came, He died, He paid for our sins. The only thing that He requires is that we accept Him as our Savior. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then to be able to accept this great salvation, the Bible says very simply, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear friend, salvation is as simple as us accepting by faith what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. 
and then calling out by faith to him and accepting that wonderful gift of salvation. The greatest decision you'll ever make is to trust Christ as Savior. And I'd like to encourage you to trust Christ today as your Savior. And then you can go to him in prayer and you can pray something like this and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you died for me on the cross. And right now, right here, I accept you as my Savior. Please save me, and I thank you for your promise to do so. And you can pray that in Jesus' name, and you can have the best news ever that you've got a home waiting for you in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.